a long line of travelers formed waiting for immigration clearance at a Florida airport. The officers in charge seemed to be exercising unusual care inspecting baggage and credentials. After waiting in line for almost two hours, one man finally said in a loud voice, entering the United States is harder than entering the kingdom of heaven. Whereupon, one of the immigration officers shot back, my friend, there's a whole lot more people trying. Now, I thought that was funny. <laughs> Christ, our King, promises us new life as we enter his eternal kingdom of love. And Christ, our King, asks us for a genuine faith response to that promise. Over and over again in the Gospels, the same message comes through. Genuine faith in the promise of new life, in the kingdom of love, can sustain us only through our love for one another in the here and now. Today, in Jerusalem, in Paris, in New York, in Madrid, in Morocco, in Buenos Aires, in Burton, and all over the world, Christ, Son of David, is celebrated as Christ the King. Christ the King gives meaning to the trivia and apparent nonsense of our everyday existence. Christ the King assures us that whatever is true and good and stunning no matter how badly it seems defeated now, will be vindicated and fulfilled in the coming of the kingdom. Over and over again in the Gospels, Jesus speaks of our fulfillment in terms of unselfishness and other-centeredness. We are on the road to paradise, when we, in Jesus' words, love one another as he has loved us. In today's Gospel episode, Jesus continues teaching this lesson to the very end, literally as he draws his final breath on the cross. He is hanging between two criminals, one of whom is concerned only about his own fate, the other, however, expresses concern for Jesus. We have been condemned justly, the second criminal says. The sentence we receive corresponds to our crimes. But this man, referring to Jesus, has done nothing criminal. And then he says, these most important and famous words. Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. To which Jesus replied, Amen, I say to you, this day you will be with me in paradise. I want to share with you today a true story. It took place on a Sunday morning during the preschool program. The principal players are Elliot, a two-year-old, and David, who is three. Elliot and David are downstairs in the hall playing while their moms and dads are upstairs in church. Suddenly a terrible scream is heard. Elliot is crying at the top of his lungs, his little body bent over. 
a supervisor runs to pick up Elliot and brings him to the kitchen. His parents have been called downstairs. Elliot's mom, Carol, picks up her little boy's shirt. His back is covered with bite marks. While playing, three-year-old David had suddenly dragged Elliot to the ground and hit him and bit him again and again. Little Elliot had no idea how to struggle out of it. When David and Jennifer, little David's teenage parents, arrive on the scene, they know exactly what has happened. Oh my God, not again, David, Jennifer screams. She then runs out of the church hall, crying hysterically. David's father picks up his son, sadly offering his apologies. I'm sorry. He knows better. I'm so sorry. He knows better. He keeps repeating as he backs out of the hall. It's not the first time David bites a child at church or school. More than once, David's family would leave a church deeply embarrassed after David acted up and hurt a child. David's behavior is just one of many struggles his parents are facing in a marriage that is already shaky at best. Everyone is stunned and embarrassed as little Elliot's wounds are cleaned and bandaged. The only one who knows what to do is Elliot's mom. Leaving Elliot with his dad, Carol goes outside to find Jennifer. I'm so sorry, Jennifer cries as she sees Carol coming toward her. My God, I'm so sorry. But Carol puts her left hand on Jennifer's shoulder and her right hand under her chin and speaks in a very soft but firm voice. Stop. Listen to me. Elliot is going to be fine. He will heal, and he will get over this. I'm not worried about Elliot, but I am worried about you and Dave. And we'll be so embarrassed about this that you'll never come back to our church. That's the only thing that worries me. We've all come to love your family, and you need to be here with us. Promise me that you'll come back next Sunday. Two mothers hold each other in the parking lot, crying for their sons. The church leadership helps David and his parents obtain counseling and continue to this day to offer the young family their love and their support. My friends, this is the kingdom of God at work. This is Jesus Christ reigning. This is the God of the living. In every act of selfless kindness and compassionate understanding, in every form of charity and outreach, in every hand extended to the poor, to the stumbler, to the lost. On this last Sunday of the church year, let us renew our commitment to be good and faithful stewards as we honor Christ our King, whose kingdom knows neither boundaries nor walls, neither rankings or class. Christ the King, whose rule is one of humble service. Christ the King, whose power is compassion, whose scepter is humility. Christ the King, whose court belongs to the poor, the forgotten, the lost, the despairing. Christ the King, whose coin of the realm is forgiveness and reconciliation. May our own imitation of Christ's compassionate stewardship 
and humble generosity to all make us worthy citizens of his eternal kingdom. Amen.